the next session. In silky fashion is going to be our first uh, speaker and she's going to talk, talk to us about uh, controlling electronic topology in a strongly correlated system. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks to the organizers for realizing this um, after some struggle. Um, I'm coming from one of the hotspot countries, Vienna, Austria is now ranking very high, not in many things, but in COVID. Um, <laughs> so we have like almost 100 seven day incidents, which is sort of top, okay. Okay, good. Let's talk about something more interesting. Try a new format. You, we use the mouse here, so the online users can can see the mouse without struggle with the laser pointer. Um, but it means I will not be looking at the back to the front. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Anyways, uh, so um, yes, I will be talking about controlling electronic topology in strongly correlated electron systems. And uh, the, the focus is on the controlling and before showing you how we can control it, uh, let me introduce as an introduction or let, let me show you uh, what we mean by electronic topology in a strongly correlated electron system. It is about a while condo semi-metal and I have to show you what the evidence for having that state is first before I show you how to uh, tune it or control it. Uh, so I will jump in right uh, right away because it's a short talk. Um, so the first uh, part will be on uh, describing the discovery of this uh, wild condo semi-metal, and it's uh, on the experimental side. It's a specific material that we uh, discovered: cerium three, bismuth four, uh, palladium three. And uh, let me just start with uh, the evidence. So what are the phenomena? Experimental phenomena that we associate with uh, this topology. Um, there are two things that I want to highlight. One is uh, specific heat, so thermodynamics. We haven't heard much about that because uh, in many of the topological systems it's not a good probe, but in strongly correlated systems, um, specific heat is generally a very good probe. You have very many uh, degrees of freedom or many, a large density of states uh, in your system and therefore um, thermodynamic reacts very strongly to it. So what we see here is uh, what we find a highly unusual uh, electronic specific heat. Um, you see it in this uh, panel here. It plots uh, a difference of specific heat. So that's the electronic component at a constant offset is subtracted divided by temperature versus T square. And it's straight on that plot. It means the electronic specific heat has a T cube temperature dependence, which is very unusual, uh, at least in a system that doesn't order or doesn't have anything else, but you don't know that yet. So I will show you that it doesn't. So that's unusual. It would, this, this kind of temperature dependence would expect for a phonon uh, contribution, but that's already subtracted. It's much smaller and we know it very well because we have the non-F reference compound. Um, this is also an important uh, characteristic for heavy fermion systems, the entropy, you just integrate up this uh, C over T and you can estimate a zero, uh, a single ion condo temperature, which tells you sort of the, the highest energy scale uh, below which you can expect to see condo physics. So above 13 Mercy. Kelvin or well above 13 Kelvin, the system is not uh, in a condo state. So you can't expect to see these features um, that are related to condo physics at temperatures well above. Okay, the second key feature is uh, a highly unusual Hall effect, which in fact you shouldn't call Hall effect at all because it's measured in zero field. So you apply strictly zero magnetic field to your sample, measure perpendicular to current a voltage, and there is one. So that's the surprise, right? There should not be one, in fact. And it's not just that there is one, but it's a very large one. So that's what we call a giant spontaneous Hall effect. Um, it is in terms of uh, conductivity, you, you rather quantified in terms of a Hall conductivity is 0.3 times uh, a 3D version of the um, quantum uh, conductivity, or in terms of Hall angle, it's 0.5. So it's a really giant effect. It's not of a percent or something. Okay, uh, it's there for all our samples. Uh, we understand very well. Uh, it's very reproducible. So. We, we have this effect. 
Um, it's not a misalignment or anything that's, of course, been taken care of. So it's a real intrinsic spontaneous uh, Hall effect. Okay, so that's the phenomena, the two key phenomena. Let's look at the material. The material is a, a so-called condo system. It's a condo semi-metal, in fact. Um, here is the crystal structure. It's a cubic compound. Um, quite many atoms in the uh, unit cell. I want to just highlight a few aspects. So one important aspect is that it breaks inversion symmetry. And you see that with uh, just uh, taking most of the atoms and just leaving in some. If you take a serum atom and you um, mirror it at the um, center of the unit cell, you end up in a, in a platinum or palladium atom, depending on whether you have this uh, compound of platinum or palladium. So that's isostructural. Okay, so it breaks inversion symmetry. It's non central symmetric. Um, it is composed of very heavy elements, notably bismuth is the highest, the, the heaviest uh, stable uh, element, but also serum and platinum or palladium are large set uh, elements. And it is, uh, it pre preserves time reversal symmetry. And we confirmed that by the most sensitive technique you can, uh, that's muon spin rotation at Pauchero Institute, where this is done uh, uh, very, very precisely. And you can see here two curves of zero field um, symmetry. That is the, the quantity that is measured in MUSR. And uh, one is for the temperatures above 10, at 10 Kelvin and one is at 0.26. And um, as you can see, there is no difference whatsoever. So they totally collapse. And that is also seen by extracting the rotation rate from these curves and there is uh, nothing happening uh, as function of temperature. So there is absolutely nothing happening that could sort of trivially explain the spontaneous Hall effect. It's not spurious magnetism. Okay, the model. Um, and that's uh, due to uh, Jim Yao Si and his group. Um, I'm just giving a cartoon version as it was shown by my PhD student. So it's an experimentalist cartoon for what the model is. It's a periodic Anderson model on a diamond lattice. And that's really the simplest version where you could capture uh, the essential symmetry. So the inversion, uh, lack of inversion symmetry. And uh, that can be treated in a certain way uh, in the strong coupling uh, limit. Um, and the key, key result is that what is obtained in this, uh, from this model is this kind of uh, electronic band, a very narrow band with wire nodes pinned essentially to the Fermi energy. So that's the key result here. And it comes really out of uh, a model, sort of the simplest model that you could write down that has of course the condo interaction uh, that has the, the, the forbidding of on-site uh, double occupancy for the localized, so meaning the, 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 the F electrons in the serum. Um, and it has a fouquet Millet type of uh, description for the conduction electrons. And if you solve it in the strong coupling limit, then you get this wire node pinned to the Fermi surface um, in an extremely flat band. So that's the key result. Uh, look at the DFT band structure. So that's up in issue. That's uh, density functional theory. There are wire nodes because the symmetry, of course, is there in the system. So it is uh, obeyed also by the non-interacting um, conduction by the by the conduction electrons only. But these nodes are very far away from the Fermi surface, so they could never give rise to the phenomena we observe. Okay, the understanding that comes from sort of Combining uh, the, the, the model result and the experiments is the following. Um, well, I mean, you might have guessed uh, this uh, specific heat. So this uh, um, T2 cube specific heat is, uh, as, as it would be also the result of uh, linearly dispersing phonons, is directly the result of linearly dispersing um, electronic bands. We couldn't tell from this whether it's Weil or Dirac. It's the linear dispersion. And um, from the magnitude of the slope, we can extract the, uh, the, the corresponding velocity. So it's the slope of this uh, behavior and it is below 1000. So it's really very strongly renormalized compared to the Fermi energy by roughly um, three orders of magnitude. And that responds very nicely with the comparison of the condo temperature to the Fermi temperature. So it's roughly a three 
orders of magnitude renormalization. Um, and that um, is, is how we understand it, that, that we see it in fact at, uh, in a relatively wide temperature range down to the lowest temperatures confirms that this uh, must be pinned essentially to the Fermi energy. Otherwise we couldn't see this uh, in the specific heat. The understanding of the second part uh, goes back to um, a calculation or a prediction of uh, Soderman and Fu. Um, they have in principle, so in principle it's understood that you should have a spontaneous Hall effect in a system with broken inversion symmetry and preserved time reversal symmetry. And uh, the origin is that the Y nodes are uh, sources and sinks of Berry curvature. And this Berry curvature um, will deviate electrons that are moving. So I have to apply an electric field. And under the action of the Berry curvature, together with the non-equilibrium distribution function G here, which is the non-equilibrium version of the Dirac distribution function, gives rise to a transverse current. So in principle, this effect is known or should, should, should be there. Albeit it has not been detected in non-interacting Y semi-metals. And the reason can be maybe uh, understood from here. So what has been done um, is in the perturbative regime. So just do an, uh, um, a Taylor expansion and take the very first term of, of this expression here. Take the first term, um, then the Fermi distribution function come back here and you have the derivative of uh, the, the very um, curvature with respect to wave vector, that's the Berry curvature dipole. That has then been calculated um, from uh, ab initio for tantalum arsenide, for instance. And the result is that, well, there should be an effect, that's the recurvature dipole here, um, but the effect should be tiny. So that's the whole angle that is expected is smaller than 10 to minus four, even if you tune the chemical potential to the ideal place. So it should be there, it should be tiny. And that's possibly the reason why it wasn't observed. It should be a two omega effect, right? It's an out of equilibrium. You need to apply voltage in order to see it. That's why it, uh, um, if you measure it as function of frequency, you should see it in the two omega channel. Um, what we see is quite different. Um, we see this effect much, much larger, as you see, not only 10 to minus four, but 0.5. And in addition, we also see on top of the two omega that is predicted from this first order term, right? The first trivial term is two omega. We see also one omega response. And that was giving us a, a headache in the beginning, but we understand now where it comes from. And uh, the reason is that the situation in which we are is depicted here. So we have this Berry curvature divergence near a Y node. And if your Fermi energy is very close to the node, you're really probing the divergence. And now if you apply an electric field, which is sort of imaged here, this uh, light uh, red one is without the field, and then you apply even a, just a tiny field, you um, create a deviation from the equilibrium situation where you never have a small quantity. So your delta K over the K Y node is never small because you are sitting so close to the Fermi energy. So you cannot expect to be ever in the perturbative regime um, that was treated um, by, by the FT on the previous page. And uh, that means that we are not in this regime. So this is the regime that was treated uh, with the Berry curvature dipole. We are right away in the fully non-equilibrium regime where you expect in fact an omega and a two omega component as we observe an experiment. Okay, so that uh, we understood why we are sort of so sensitive to any tiny uh, electric field, it creates large effects. Um, okay, so that's the introduction. Now I have five minutes for the main part, right? Challenging, okay. I will make it. Um, so is that an isolated phenomenon? Is this just this material and maybe by coincidence that model that's not really up in the show, right? It's, 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 it's a model that seems to work, uh, explain the, uh, the results, but of course it's not a, a direct modeling of the material. So, so where are we? Are there other materials? Can we drive it? Is it a general phenomenon? And that's of course what we want to find out. And um, then we could ask the question that we can sort of find something that has been so instructive in topologically trivial, strongly correlated systems, or in particular heavy fermion systems, where we have 
created such uh, so-called global phase diagrams where we understand the different phases that can appear um, and the materials real realizing that. So that gives a lot of understanding of the field and not just of a given material. So, so these are theoretical parameters that are identified as the key parameters in the problem. And then experiments sort of try to cross these phase diagrams and see whether, whether that is confirmed. And I just give you two examples here of, of what is behind in terms of experiment behind uh, sort of finding, sort of confirming this theoretical prediction. Um, these are um, quantum criticality derived sort of, these are lines here between phases and these are quantum phase transitions that separate. So it's a zero temperature phase diam, quantum phase transitions that separate between the different ones. And if you have a quantum phase transition, it leads to quantum critical behavior and that governs much of the phase diagrams in heavy firm systems. So you can look from the top, that will be non-fermi liquid behavior, and then you know where your phases are changing. So it's a very elegant way to trace out phases, but also from the fluctuations, you can study this by optics or by neutron scattering. You can learn a lot about what the fluctuations are like, the quantum critical fluctuations are like, and then understand a lot about the phases. For instance, certain quantum critical fluctuations would tell you that you have Fermi surface reconstructions or not. So there's a lot to be learned if you, if you study these phase diagrams in this way. Um, and I just flash one of the recent highlights out of this quantum criticality here, we very recently discovered a very interesting superconducting phase with superconductivity boosted toward the quantum critical point. So we are really zooming down here in the very low temperature regime below eight millikelvin. Okay, but let's go back because I want to show you about the topology. So what is behind in very simple terms is competing interactions in the condo systems. You have the condo interaction and the so-called RKKY interaction that leads to magnetism and condo interaction leads to uh, paramagnetic state. If you want to change, uh, not, not if you want, so, so you very small variation of external parameters have big effects because you just need to tip the balance between these different uh, competing interactions. Uh, furthermore, there is local moments involved and conduction electron spins. So you expect magnetic field to be extremely good tuning parameter in this setting, right? You have the Z effect that acts on magnetic uh, moments and that is definitely going to tune you through such systems. Okay, so will it still, will it, will it act on the topological state? And I'm just flashing here two band structures of a topological insulator and a wire semi-metal. And you know that these uh, interesting crossing points here, they are um, come about by strong spin orbit coupling and they are protected by certain symmetries. So will that be tunable? I mean, this is a very robust, op these are very robust objects, um, which you can maybe image with these double, uh, very strong knots here that you can make. So will we be able to tune that at all? And um, if you look at non-interacting wild semi-metals, the answer might be that, oh, it seems very difficult. Uh, for instance, it has been done by ARPES, an ARPES study on these three different compounds has shown that the wild node splitting changes in fact very little. If we, even if we go fully from three di to three different materials, right? You could expect that maybe only slight doping would do something, but you see even going from one to the next compound, it's very little uh, that is happening. Um, also magnetic field doesn't have to have big effects here. So if you have a large magnetic field, what happens in these systems, there is quantum oscillations, they have very high mobilities, and uh, some observations seem to suggest that there has been even tunneling of zero levels, uh, zero Landau level um, orbits between one and the adjacent Y node being observed. But it's not really changing the distance of the Y nodes. It's an, it's an effect that's interesting, but has nothing to do with tuning the topology. Okay, so what we do here is indeed we use magnetic field and we try to see what happens to the system. And well, there's a large list of collaborators. Uh, we also do high fields to do this study. And uh, what we see is first, uh, we have this curve here is the while uh, uh, the, the semi-metal behavior in zero field, it gets successively suppressed. We see that in the Hall coefficient, we have 
a larger gap and a small hybridization gap. That's what we see that the system wants to be a very narrow gap condo insulator, but ultimately at the lowest temperatures, while well, you see a finite density of states, which is consistent with the system, in fact, being a semi-metal. Um, one uh, other observation is that the magnetization has uh, a signature that is very similar to the reference material serum bismuth platinum, which has a condo insulator to a uh, heavy fermium metal transition at a certain field. And we see that here too. So there is one characteristic field scale where the condo insulator that is somehow in the background collapses to be a metal. Okay, a few more minutes, three maybe. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so now that the mo most, so, so in the background, there seems to be something happening, but let's look at the topology. So our, at our two key signatures, the specific heat and the even, or the, the, the spontaneous hall, which in fine field, the corresponding signature is an even in field hall. So you do not what you usually do with hall, you symmetrize instead of anti-symmetrizing. And there we see how with field, the signature disappears. So here, the specific heat, so the linear in T square uh, specific heat coefficient really happens uh, up to lower and up to lower and lower um, fields. So meaning with field, you sort of suppress uh, this, this contribution. And for the Hall effect, you suppress this contribution in a sort of strange and bumpy way, which by the way, is very nicely uh, consistent with a detailed uh, calculation that Sarah Grafler made again on that um, model system, where you see how the Y nodes move in momentum space until they uh, ultimately annihilate under the Zeeman effect of uh, the magnetic field. So that's what we uh, assume to happen here, that we collapse the Y nodes at one field, and at a later field, we uh, close the condo insulator gap. And um, that can be uh, analyzed in more detail. I can report on that in the using the normal Hall effect, but I don't have time here. Let me just summarize uh, the phase diagram. So these are the characteristics of our uh, wild condo semi-metal. They all collapse at the first magnetic field. And what we are left with is sort of the gapping out this uh, wild, uh, wild contribution. We have only the background condo insulator gap in here. And if we put even larger field, we collapse the condo insulator to a heavy fermion metal. Um, okay, so we think that is the first time that actually wild node annihilation has been seen that uh, occurs at this place here. It occurs um, in a sharp uh, transition. We think it is a topological quantum phase transition. We see that in the Hall effect, how sharp this transition is. Um, it is clearly spread from anything happening to the background. So it is really what we call a genuine uh, suppression of topology because we haven't done anything else to the system. The background has only been smoothly evolving. It's still strongly correlated. It is even still in the back, a condo insulator gap that collapses only at much larger field, and there is no magnetism whatsoever. So we tune nothing but the topology in the system here. And it's possible because we have spin physics in there without magnetism, right? The condo effect is spin physics without needing uh, a, mag a magnet. Um, to summarize, instead of a summary, I put uh, this uh, uh, plot here. Um, we have clearly identified uh, a wild condo semi-metal. And of course it can exist only in the limit of strong spin orbit coupling and uh, with the certain symmetries. In our case, time reversal symmetry is preserved, but version symmetry is broken. Um, but it has been a little cloud somewhere in the nowhere so far. And uh, our work uh, on magnetic field tuning is the start of a more systematic uh, investigation where we have uh, for the first time sort of systematically followed where this uh, wild condo semi can move. It will first go to a condo insulator phase, then finally to a heavy Fermi metal phase as function of magnetic fields. And of course now uh, the field is open for 
many more studies. You could choose different starting points and maybe use a similar strategy to fill the space in order to come to a more uh, broader understanding of this whole phen phenomenology. Okay, thank you. audience so if not I'll, I'll start with one so in order to compute this um nonlinear hall effect so you need the full non-equilibrium distribution function and i guess this is maybe more of a theoretical question but uh, yeah it has not been done okay i think that's the answer well so 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 is it just a general expectation that you should have this linear uh, term? Is it linear and in, linear? In, in oh, a this response? is sort of a, a cartoon indeed. It's nothing but a cartoon. It's not a calculation, but it's data. So the points are real data. We right. ob do observe omega and one omega and two omega, right. and this is a cartoon. Yes, okay. it's not a calculation. I see. So nobody's actually sat down and tried to figure out what yeah, this go ahead. <laughs> 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 No, easy. It has a reason that only the first term was calculated. So I have another sort of unrelated question. So you said that with the applied field, you're driving the system out of the kind of vile semi-metal into a kind of insulator phase. What does the transition itself look like? I may have missed it. You probably... Um, what the transition itself looks like. I mean, what we see is that... Is there a peak in specific heat or... Uh, no. Sorry. Almost there. So the, the the Hall signature disappears. This is really the even in field. So that is the corresponding to the Spanius Hall, but in finite field, of course, because we are field tuning. It disappears um, with field. Okay, so you really you have that response and it disappears. And in specific heat, you lose the T cube term. It's suppressed to lower and lower and lower fields until you wouldn't call it a, a T cube term. Right, but the, so the residual then dependence is T squared. So there, is, there, is there a finite density of states at, if you could tune right to transition where the two vial points are merging, is there a finite density of states there or is it? A density of states plot, how could we do that? Well, I mean, just in terms of specific heat. No, no, that's finite. not obvious. I mean, maybe the, op, the, 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 the most sort of, I mean, obvious way to see that this is a sharp transition is the, the normal Hall effect. So this is anti-symmetrized Hall, which measures a density of states in some way, right? And that has sort of a sharp change at this point. So this is the first transition where the wild nodes annihilate. And we follow it as function of temperature and always determine the full width self maximum of this kink. And this is shown here. So it goes over more than an order of magnitude in a straight line on a log log plot, meaning that it becomes very sharp. So that's maybe the closest we can get to answer your question. Let me see if we have any online questions. No, no online questions. Oh, I'm just question. Anna. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that you have a linear dispersion relation, yeah? For your, uh, uh, so that means you have realistic fermions, but on the other hand, you have a large effective mass. So I thought with some difficulties to uh, interpret this. Well, I mean, so you know the... very well that it's the slope of the linear dispersion that even in a non-interacting system is the Fermi velocity and not uh, light velocity, right? So that Fermi velocity in our case is the strongly renormalized velocity of a heavy fermion system. So instead of having steep Linear bands, we have flat linear bands. So it's really about the slope of, of the dis linear dispersion. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So if you say the uh, wire nodes annihilate, uh, what do you mean by that? Do they shrink in their distance in K space or do they go down in intensity, so to speak? Also, do they stay put? Do you know that? Well, well, I mean, experiment says the, the, the response vanishes, but I mean, from this work that um, is reported um, here, 
Um, it's of course on the model system. It's this uh, periodic Anderson model on the diamond lattice. Um, it's very detailed, studied in great detail how the wild nodes move in momentum space in certain directions, and that we think might give these dips here in the in the hall until they all meet at the gamma point and annihilate. That's the theoretical happening. Yes, and it's consistent with our data. Of course, I cannot prove from the data that that this is. Nice. Uh, very nice. Have you thought of uh, looking at thermal hall? Yeah, indeed. Hmm. We are working on it since almost a year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's hard, but it's it's hard because the samples are hard. Hmm. So yes, uh, tiny. The best samples are small, and and for thermal hall, it's not so easy. But we are working on it. Hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure we Good. we get out something very hmm. soon. Okay. Um, have you also seen a superconducting version of these wires, like a wild con the superconductors? Um, we, we haven't uh, identified that yet. Oh. So, so we, we thought so in the beginning, but there's, uh, in, if we are not extremely careful with having the samples extremely stoichiometric, then there can be a surface superconductor, which might be interesting as such, but it's, we, we think it's extrinsic. So we think it's a surface phase and has nothing to do with uh, intrinsic effects. Okay, uh, we can probably do one more. Uh, is there any hints about the mechanism for this uh, strange metal behavior? It seems it happens in many different materials. Oh, that's a totally different question. So strange metal behavior, yeah. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience who can say many things about it, but I mean, so, so in, in the heavy fermion systems, I was talking about, um, I am convinced it has to do with condo destruction. So because we see in this range of strange method behavior, we see um, dynamical scaling of the optical conductivity, which measures charge or the current with current current uh, correlation, and that shows quantum critical dynamical scaling. And that tells you that it's in fact the charge degree freedom in uh, directly involved in this quantum criticality. Okay, so I think we got to stop. Let's.